Hi, English 1301 students, it's Dr. Murray. This is my second video about um, Mr. Death, the documentary. Um, so in this video, I wanna talk first a, a little about the structure of the film. Um, then I wanna talk about a particular scene in the film, um, which, you know, I think if I give a little bit of background and kind of some of my thinking about the scene, it might be clarifying in that it's a scene that if I just raised it as a subject, you might be going, I don't really see why that scene's in the film or what we're supposed to take away from that scene. Um, and then I wanna just make some final comments about just essay number two. So let me start by talking about the structure of the film. Um, I think that the film is kind, I, I guess what I would say is, I urge you to kind of look at the film in terms of having three sections, okay? Kind of like a beginning, middle, and end. And this will actually be helpful for writing the first section of essay two, which is a summary in that you can have one body paragraph for each of the three sections in the film and you can write your thesis statement in a way where if you explain the three parts of the film, you'll cover the full trajectory of the film in your thesis. I, I'll explain that more at another time or, or towards the end of this video. But I will just say, here are the three parts of the film. The first third of the film is about Fred Leuchter's life and profession or his, his biography and his, and his profession as a manufacturer and, and repairer of um, execution equipment. Um, so that's kind of the part one of the film. The middle part of the film is about his involvement in the Ernst Zundel trial. And it's really easy to see where the first third ends and the second third begins because the screen goes black and then it says the Ernst Zundel trial on the screen and then we get into that. I think in a way the Ernst Zundel trial is the crux of what this movie's about because that was the context in which Fred made his claims that the Holocaust never happened. Uh, it doesn't mean that what's in part one about Fred's life and profession is, isn't important. But for instance, when you get to part two of essay two, so essay two will consist of two parts, a summary and a response. The summary's got to be totally objective. What is the movie about? No opinion from you. The response will include your opinions. It'll be, you know, what do you think is most um, interesting about the film? What do you what do you think of Leuchter? What do you think of the claims he makes? How, you know, that that kind of stuff. And um, so those are the two parts of the paper. What I would say is in part two of the paper. I'm most concerned with you engaging with with kind of the Zundel trial or neo-Nazi involvement of Fred Leuchter or the Leuchter report in which he, in print, makes the claims about the Holocaust. I'm not that interested in, in part two of essay two that you reflect on his profession and whether or not you believe in the death penalty. I mean, it's not utterly irrelevant but the movie is really about his claims about the Holocaust. So let's make, keep that in mind in the response section of essay two. Um, so back to the structure. Part one about his life and profession. Part two about his involvement in the Ernst Zundel trial and then his subsequent writing of the Leuchter Report and involvement in neo-Nazi conferences, white supremacist rallies and all that stuff. Part three is kind of where everything goes wrong for Fred Leuchter. His wife leaves him, people stop hiring him to manufacture and repair equipment for executions at prisons. Why? Probably because they heard that he was involved in these white supremacist or neo-Nazi groups and they said, well, it's a free country, we can hire anyone we want. This guy's a Nazi, we don't wanna hire Nazis. So he, he moans at the end of the film about how unjust this is 
But if he has the freedom to make the claims he makes, other people have the freedom to hire who they want. So, you know, he can make his claims, but that doesn't ensure you employment if people don't want to hire you. It's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, but what I would say is the subtitle of the film, the film is called Mr. Death, colon, and then we get the subtitle, The Rise and Fall of Fred A. Leuchter Jr., so I think the rise is not the first third of the film. I think the rise is the middle of the film because that's when Fred Lichter gets involved in the neo-Nazi conferences, in, in the Ernst Zundel trial, and all, and all that, publishes the Leuchter report. So it's, it's a rise in the sense that he starts to gain some um, uh, recognition publicly, whether it's praise or condemnation. I mean, he's certainly getting lots of praise from people in the, you know, neo-Nazi community or at these conferences or from Ernst Zundel himself, but he's certainly getting condemnation from people like Shelley Shapiro and another woman that we see in the movie who are Holocaust awareness advocates who call him an anti-Semite or say that he's a monster or whatever they say. Um, they're there to show us that there's a lot of people out there, um, probably some of them, people who had relatives who died in the Holocaust, saying, this guy's a jerk, you know? And to take him seriously as a scientist is a joke. Okay, so they're going to be people criticizing the... But his rise is he's becoming well-known. Errol Morris found out about this whole phenomenon by reading the New York Times, so he's being talked about in the media... That's supposedly his rise. Now, now the subtitle is called The Rise and Fall. The fall is, well, just like he gains renown, he gets standing ovations from neo-Nazis at the conferences, he also starts not getting hired anymore by the people who used to hire him, and his wife leaves him, he's out of money, he gets, you know, car gets repossessed, or all the things he tells us at the end of the movie about his life isn't going well, that's the fall. So I think the rise and the fall is the middle and the end. I think the first part is, is kind of biographical information about him as well as his profession. Okay, so that's kind of the structure. And I think that that's important to keep in mind when you write your thesis for the summary section where you could say, you know, something like, you know, I mean, you've got to sum up in a thesis of the summary section what the film is about, hopefully in one sentence, and you could say it's about this, this, and this, and that could be section one, two, and three, and those could correspond with three body paragraphs. That's just a way to efficiently organize the summary. You would still want an introduction, then those three body paragraphs, and then a conclusion in that section, and then you're going to have you know, the response section, which is going to be a little longer than the summary, at least I'm thinking like a page longer, um, at least, if not a couple pages longer. That's going to be more complex structurally because you won't necessarily have such a simple structure, but you also have room to explore it a little more. Okay, I want to switch gears and get to this scene I was going to talk about. So the scene I wanted to talk about is in the first part of the film. And it's where Fred Leuchter tells us about the fact that at one point he was sent an electric chair. That it was sent to his home so he could repair it and then send it back to this prison. And while he is, you know, sawing into the chair to widen it and add a panel and repainting it and these things that he's doing, he's taking pictures of the chair, you know, as his process of doing the work that he's doing. And... Um, he says that when he looks at the pictures, he sees an aura. And I think what he basically, to cut the chase, means by this is he thinks he sees a spirit. And he speculates maybe when somebody got electrocuted um, in the chair, um, when they died, their spirit went into the chair. And it existed in the chair until he cut into the chair to widen it and it released the spirit. And when he took the photograph, the spirit was captured, right? Something like that. Well, I think it's important because you guys are, uh, you know, 
21st century people, that some of us, you know, experienced life for a little while in the 20th century. And in the late 20th century, when you took photographs, and certainly in the 1980s, when I suspect this happened, the thing that he's talking about, it could have been the early 90s or something, either way, but, um, um, when you took pictures, you didn't take pictures with your phone, right? You took them with a camera. And they weren't digital, they were captured on film. And when you had a roll of film that was done, you drove it down to get it developed somewhere. And when I was young growing up, you get your pictures back a week or 10 days later. Um, it was a huge breakthrough at some point when there was one hour photo. And the idea you could drop your film off and then, you know, go go do some grocery shopping and come back and your pictures have been developed or whatever. Well, one thing that was fairly common when you would get your pictures developed is you would get them back and you'd start flipping through them and errors would happen in the development, okay? In the, in the printing of the photos. And one common error that would happen was this thing called a double exposure. And a double exposure basically happens when two negatives are put in the um, enlarging machine. Uh, this is old school photographic develop. I used to work, like not as a job, but in high school I used to be in a dark room and develop photos myself and all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, you could superimpose two um, uh, negatives upon one another and you'd have what's called a double exposure, where if you had a picture of your grandmother sitting in a chair and a dog leaping for a frisbee, if you superimpose those in each other, it would look like the dog was jumping through your grandmother or something. Of course, early 20th century, when certain photographers realized this, they exploited these for artistic reasons and stuff and would create these fantastical, weird photographs with double exposures. But what ends up happening is Sometimes it happens by mistake and you get a photo and some weird effect is in there and it looks really weird. But if you know what a double exposure is, it's no big deal. You just go, oh, what a crazy weird photo. And maybe you bring it back and have them redo your photos or whatever. Here's the point. There's a very logical explanation for why Fred Lichter sees this aura in the photograph. But he doesn't even consider a logical explanation. Instead, he immediately leaps to the most improbable explanation, which is it's a picture of a ghost. Am I gonna say that it's, imp that I know for sure ghosts don't exist and it's entirely impossible that it could be? I can't say that with 100% metaphysical certainty, but I think it's highly unlikely and it's not very logical. And there is a very logical explanation which Fred does not even consider. I think that's there, even though it's, it, it, it takes some thinking and it takes explanation like this to get at it. But I think once you see it, you realize, oh, Fred, in more than one case, perhaps, you know, maybe this is how he thinks. He can leap past the most logical explanation of something towards a very implausible, fantastical explanation now, why, I don't know. Is it because he, you know, I don't know. This is part of the mystery of the film. Why is he the way he is? Why does he think it's that and not something else? Um, uh, I, that I don't necessarily know about. And if you want to talk about that in your paper, that's your game for that. And I will show you a video this week from this segment, the, 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 the show 60 Minutes did about the director, Errol Morris where he talks about that a little bit and says, you know, the real mystery isn't the claims that Fred Leiter makes about the Holocaust. Holocaust, They are wrong. He just says they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. But he says the real mystery is why Fred makes the claims. And so in this case with the aura, he's making a fantastical claim, skipping over the most logical explanation to an explanation that's it's extremely implausible and yet that's the first thing apparently he thinks of so what does that tell us about him and and is that relevant to other stuff in the film something to think about 
I'd love to keep talking, but I've got to end here. Um, more soon. Take care.